This is kind of a pathetic tree, um, but it's it's new, it's young, it's only been here three or four years. This is Quercus Muhlenbergi, and this is another native oak. And again, it'll be quite a large oak, really quite slow, slow growing. So again, about that much growth last year. When you look at the leaves, it almost looks like a chestnut. And if you look up lists of oaks, you'll actually see chestnut oak, Quercus aprinus. Uh, you'll see Quercus acutissima, which uh, we have on the list, but we have out of cutties, that don't look like typical oak leaves. And this one doesn't look like a typical oak leaf per se, right? If I put that on a test, even from my second years. Did you come off your motorbike? Yes. Oh, you did? Ooh. Oh, this? No, 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 no. I had a fire accident. A fire accident? Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> um, it looks more like a, uh, sorry if I embarrass you, it looks more like a uh, chestnut leaf, like uh, Quercus dent uh, Quercus, Cassinia dentata, Cassinia sativa, the sweet chestnuts that you eat, you get in the store at Christmas. So not a typical oak-like leaf. But again, you see the fall color, autumn color is not that great. And actually this one is, is a bit of a tough go out of here, out here for it because it's fully exposed and such. And this used to be more of the parking lot, so there's crappy soil and crappy drainage under here too, so it's uh, struggling a bit. Nonetheless, it's going to be like almost uh, Quercus uh, bicolor in character. It's one of those trees that you typically wouldn't use in a uh, you know residential landscape because it's not that pretty. It's more it's of its stature and its size and such. And you saw that, hence why I showed you that picture of that oak today. Right, that's not something you'd plant in a condo over here, but what a majestic tree, and hence why they spent, you know, close to $100,000 to move that tree, what, 1,500 feet? Yeah. I mean, pretty incredible feat of, of, uh, of well, effort, even, you know, to move it like that. Um, so th this, this kind of tree fits into that same sort of class that it's not a tree that you would plant in the cultured landscape. Now, because we're in an institutional landscape, we can actually use trees where we would use shrubs to bring down scale, right? Has Sue talked to you about humanizing and, and scale and residential landscaping? Well, she will. Huge buildings like this, and, and this is where we're going to talk about our next tr plant. Instead of a shrub on a residential setting, you'd use a tree to kind of bring down the scale so that it doesn't feel as intimidating to us little people running around, okay? Pests and diseases, again, are few and far between. There are the, you know, there's some leaf chewing and stuff going on here. When I, when I look at a pest problem, and this is a caution when you do your plant profiles, you'll be able to find 100 pests that feed on your plant. I only want to really know about the pests that are really problematic, and you've got to back that up with something called research, right? I mean, it's scary sometimes when students do plant profiles and they start to list the pests and I was like, there was no way I'd ever plant or get within a thousand miles of that plant because it's got all these pests, right? But that in reality is not the case. It might mean that someone's found a bunch on it at once and recorded it and found it repeatedly, but they might not be a problem. So when we look at these trees, there are some pests on them, but they're not really problematic, right? 